everybody to this special session of the Wonka World Conference 2021. This special session is about universal health coverage. And my, my name is Professor Amanda Barnard. I'm from Australia. And along with Professor Chris Van Wheel, who many of you will know as the past president of Wonka, we're chairing this session of four very distinguished speakers speaking on this topic. All the speakers are going to present and we'll have a panel discussion at the end. We are very, very keen to get the questions that all of you will have about this very important topic to us as family physicians. And we encourage you to put, to put your questions in the Q and A section on your screen and we will get those and present them to the panelists at the end. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Professor Chris Van Wheel to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Amanda. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce as our first speaker, a very distinguished person from WHO, Dr. Salam Hassan Salam, who is educated at Harvard, but more importantly, he is a very experienced uh, staff member of WHO with a very strong feelings about primary care, very supportive for us, but also with a very critical mind to understand what is and what is not uh, important in our discipline. So without much ado, I would like to hand over to Hassan to you for your presentation on universal health coverage. <music> Hello, everybody. Uh, my brief presentation is about universal health coverage in our region, the Eastern Mediterranean region, in which I'm going to focus on three main topics. The first one is dealing with an overview for the universal health coverage in the EMR. Second is about the key challenges facing universal health coverage. And the third is about the priorities and the recommended action toward universal health coverage by the year of the 20. 30, we are talking about nine years from now. As a background, most probably already familiar with this, uh, and this is dealing with the uh, Sustainable Development Goal, which actually adopted in the United Nations back to the year of the 2015 under the uh, title of 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development Goal. Goal number three is, is about the good health and well being. And the target number 3.8, it is about universal health coverage. What is the situation of the universal health coverage? Still in our region, the UHC 16 basic health service, around 40% of our population, they don't have an access to this 16 basic health service, which actually very high comparing to the global numbers. By the way, this is the most updated data and the data for the 2019 is going to be released in December, with, uh, this coming December, within a couple of weeks, during the World uh, Universal Health Day on December 12. The universal health coverage actually is facing a serious challenge in our region. And in June, a couple of months ago, we published our report about the progress on the 50 uh, health-related sustainable development goals. And actually, this report identifies the main challenges facing sustainable development to go, mainly about the weak governance. This is a very serious challenge. In addition to the fragmentation of the healthcare system and the availability of the data, there is a serious uh, challenge about uh, the limitation for the data availability, countries under the emergency, and the gender equality and the health disparities. Let us go in more detail about these challenges facing our region to reach to universal health coverage. The most important challenge is the impact of the emergencies, fragile and humanitarian setting. Our region for the Eastern Mediterranean region is the, the home to more than 100 million people that they need the humanitarian assistance. This is a very serious challenge. In addition to this, around in, in the range of 
40, sorry, 49% of the whole world refugees, in addition to the 44% of the whole internal display globally, are from our region. This is the most serious challenge facing our region to reach to universal health coverage within the coming nine years. The second one is about the weak governance. Our region is fully committed to the universal health coverage. All the countries are actually committed. But on the other side, still, there is a weak technical capacities for the ministries of health to formulate the policies toward effective universal health coverage. This is the second serious challenges facing our region. To start with, our region for the Eastern Mediterranean, actually, they are very low investor in health. We keep talking about the primary health care, that how it is very important for the universal health coverage. But on the other side, the government is, uh, is spending on the primary health care, it may drop to just only 5%. And the most of the budget around between 50 until it reached to around, say, 80%, of the government health budget, it may go to the hospital. Even with this huge budget to the hospital, still it is it may reach between 12 until around 18% of the health care associated with infection. And this is, by the way, this is the highest in the world. 8% of the inpatient cases experience adverse events, which we call it the medical error. And the main reason for this, because almost around, say, 50% of the countries, almost 10 countries in our region, they don't have infection prevention control program. Because of the limited budget directed to the primary health care sector and the weak referral system, in addition to the limited quality, this it ends to around, say, 80 up to reach to 90% of the hospital case actually are treatable at the primary health care level. Uh, around 90% of the primary health care facilities, they don't have full comprehensive essential medicine list. Just only 10% of them, they have this essential medicine list. And the antibiotics, usually they are provided for almost 70% of the primary health care prescriptions. This is very, very serious. Family practice in our regions facing a serious problem. The main reason for this, because the shortage of the family physician and the 93% of the physician working at the primary health care level, they are generalists. They are not a general practitioner and they are not a family physician. The essential service package in most of the countries, it is kind of an implicit one versus to be an explicit one. 80% of the countries, 80% of the countries, they don't provide treatment, comprehensive treatment for the non-communicable diseases at the level of the primary health care. Such situation, at least that the, the diabetes prevalence in our region, it is the highest globally. All these facts actually leads to that the private health sector taking the lead in the service delivery, and on average, it reached to around, say, 66% of the service are provided by the health sector provider with very high out of pocket in our region. Above all of this situation, and since March of the last year for the 2020 COVID pandemic impact came, and in a recent study to the World Bank, it mentioned that for each COVID death, more than two women and the children had lost their lives because of the disruption to the health systems. Talking about disruption of the health system and in particular for the service delivery, it reached to more than 70% of the service has been disrupted. This is back to early 2020, which was the highest globally. Recently, during this 2021, we conducted the same assessment and we found that it reached to just only 30%, which is much way better situation now. But the problem, it is not about the interruption of the services only. Now we are in the era for the COVID-19 vaccination. Still around 25% of the countries in our region, 
it reached less than 10 percent of the population they received the vaccine again this is very serious uh, challenges in our region let us move to the last part of my presentation and it's talking about the priorities recommended action toward universal health coverage by the year of the 2030. Political stability and ending the conflict. This is top priority for us. Without having good political stability and the ending of the conflict, it will continue universal health coverage for many countries and their population to be as a dream for this population and this country. On the left side of the screen, you can find that all the countries already committed to the global compact and to the universal health coverage 2030. This is on the left side. And on the right side, this is what I got from the internet, which actually presents the tensions between the countries in our region and the cutting of the diplomatic relation. And definitely this situation affects the development in general and universal health coverage in particular. Again without having political stability and the ending of the conflicts between in, in the countries this will continue the issue for the universal health coverage will continue as a dream for most of the populations in our region the second important topic that as i mentioned that the countries are committed to the universal health coverage but many countries in our region they are not clear what model of care they are going to use and I mean by the model of care, not only the service delivery, but in addition to this, we are talking about the governance, about the finance, about the technology, about the information system. All of these things they take us an idea about the model of care. In the World Health Assembly, back to the last year for the 2020, they already adopted and approved the operational framework for the primary health care and deliver it. This is including the level number five, which is talking about the model of care. What do we mean exactly by the model of care? The model of care give us a kind of conceptualization of how the service should be delivered. And this is including the management of the population, management of the service, in addition to the selection and organization of the service. The third important topic that primary health care partners they need to work together through the global action plan and i mean by the primary health care partners this is including the who unicef UNAIDS, unhcr unipa and our colleagues from the arab board of health specialization and of course our colleague from Munka, in which actually we already listed uh, the, this four topics of our collaboration for the coming period and actually it started during this year for the 2021 and it's coming and continue in the uh, next biennium inshallah thank you colleagues and i have around 90 second a uh, video that it's talking about the universal health coverage and i would like to share this video with you 2030 it sounds like years away but the clock is ticking time is short and we have a promise to keep. A promise to ensure all people and communities in all countries receive the health services they need when and where they need them without facing financial hardship. But there's still a lot of work to do. At least half of the world's people lack full coverage for essential health services. More than 800 million people spend over 10% of their family budget on health services and close to 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty because of healthcare expenses. We cannot accept a world like that. We cannot afford a world like that. That's why countries all over the world are investing in universal health coverage by enabling communities to make decisions about their own health, like breastfeeding, healthy diets, and bed nets by reaching the most remote villages with life-saving services like vaccines, by building networks of affordable primary care clinics to provide treatment locally for everyday health needs, and by providing more sophisticated services at hospitals for life's ups and downs. 
The thing is, universal health coverage not only improves health and increases life expectancy, it also reduces poverty, creates jobs, drives inclusive economic growth, improves gender equality, and protects countries against epidemics. With investments, every nation can increase its range of health services, expand its health workforce, improve its infrastructure, ensure essential medicines are available, and protect people from the cost of paying for care out of their own pockets. We call on the global community to make universal health coverage a political priority so everyone can access quality health care without facing financial hardship. If we work together, we can make universal health coverage a reality and ensure a safer, fairer and healthier world for all. Thank you very much, Hassan, for this energetic and moving and very realistic presentation. Uh, I think we will have a lot of discussion on it, but therefore I now immediately go to our next speaker. I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Shabir Moza, uh, who is professor at Witwatersrand University in Johannesburg, but more importantly, has been president of Wonka Africa and has done wonderful things together with the Pima Famet and the networking in that part of the world. Therefore, who has a better view on universal health coverage in Africa? Shabir, over to you. Hi. My name is Shabir Musa. I'm going to talk about UHC in Africa, my experiences, our experiences and perspectives. I'm going to share a little bit about the history of uh, PHC in Africa, the AHAIC report, which is really useful, and building Afro-PHC as um, our experience has gone. So let's start with the uh, building history of uh, PHC in Africa. Um, PHC in Africa is not, you know, just since 1978. In fact, in the 1940s, the CARCs had developed community-oriented primary care in South Africa, and there were other uh, elements of such community orientation across Africa. But 1978 is an important hallmark or important milestone in Africa. Um, certainly in the 80s and 90s, despite the Al Ma'ata talking of comprehensive health care, uh, based on the cheap versions of selective um, PHC, but driven by UNICEF and UNAIDS um, over the last 20 years or 20 years from 1980s to 2000s. It's been marked by uh, very uh, selective primary health care verticalized programs. In 2001, heads of state agreed to the Abuja Declaration of 15% of health spend um, by 2015. Um, in 2006, there were resolutions um, by the AU and the WHO Afro about universal health care being an important uh, question and basing that on a well-functioning district health service. And they promoted a bottom-up approach. In 2008, uh, the Ugo Dugu Declaration was uh, raised the question of that there's a lot of commitment to primary health care, but in action, it's not really um, coming through. Uh, primary health care approach was emphasized once more uh, the importance of decentralized care, intersectoral collaboration, and the whole international nature of primary health care being comprehensive, continuous, integrated, and community based was emphasized. But still, in that declaration, um, the statement was made let's use priority programs as the entry point to strengthen national systems. Um, in fact, in 2012, the roadmap for scaling up human resources in African healthcare um, did not mention primary healthcare at all, even though it set out six strategic areas for improvement. In 2017, fairly recently, WHO resolutions um, basically called for a holistic approach to strengthening healthcare systems 
moving away from the program specific uh, approach of the MDG era and I think that's a major shift and called again for efficient integrated person-centered delivery um, with intersectoral collaboration for SDGs. Certainly the person-centeredness um, is beginning to grow in the African context um, slowly. Uh, in 2018 at WHO Afro there were resolutions around financing and importantly it talked about increasing domestic financing um, where many have not achieved their budget declaration um, and talked about the need to move out of pocket into prepayment financing systems um, and I think that's a very important issue as well as uh, talking about um, uh, strategic purchasing and the fact that one needs to move away from dependencies on external financing. So these were important de debates in the last few few years that have shifted the equation. In 2018, um, the WHO contribution to the Astana report basically complained of the challenge of poor de decentralization where not only is the managers of the, on the on the district level not capable, the managers higher up are actually reluctant to provide um, the power for human resource management and financial management procurement. Um, and I think this is the problem of chicken and egg in Africa. In 2019, in a report by the WHO on the state of Africa, African health, um, it talked of a worrying situation with underperformance on several levels. And um, speaking of the WHO uh, building blocks as actually perpetuating a verticalized service and that one needs to somehow move beyond into talking of a uh, intervention that's collaborative um, and, and in fact very person-centered. So a PHC performance initiative is certainly a useful um, uh, framework and in fact many of the issues within the black box of service delivery are not being dealt with adequately and particularly the population management approach which includes empanelment is not a, in the lexicon of WHO Afro. Um, Team-based care is there but still um, not very clear and more about task shifting than actually integrate teamwork. Um, the availability of primary health care providers um, is still a far distance away with primary health care itself not being clear as to where it, sits, uh, where it stops and where secondary care begins in primary health care or in health systems in Africa. And I think the nature of primary health care being continuous, collaborative and comprehensive is still a dispute within Africa. And I think one really needs that to be impact as we proceed. Uh, to support African primary health care for UHC. So the AHAC report uh, is an important uh, contribution to this debate. Um, essentially, I was a commissioner in that uh, report, which is the Africa Health Agenda International Conference, and there was a commission called for um, with 12 commissioners. And in that, we basically came up with four elements, um, showed the, you know, represented the performance or assessed the performance um, looked at the challenges, the opportunities which we thought important, as well as recommendations. And I'm going to share those elements very briefly with you. In terms of performance, uh, the health outcomes in Africa are improving, but they're still very dismal compared to the global numbers. Um, effective coverage is very poor. Only half of the people, less than half the people in the, in the continent receive what they need in terms of health care. Um, and then those who do are more rich than poor. Um, and the, the quality is not adequate. Um, there's also poor risk protection, financial risk protection, with one in 10 persons in Africa actually having um, a, a problem, health problem that, that uh, sends them into poverty, one, uh, you know, in ten, one in 10 people. Um, the context is in fact um, very challenging. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we have inadequate economic growth and in fact a high dependency ratio and the number of people in Africa, certainly the number of people depending on other, those who work is very high. And uh, we are characterized by political instability and wars um, and, and the fact that we have really rapid and, um, and unplanned urbanization. Um, climate change is an issue in Africa um, and we also have the legacy of colonization and neo-colonial influence. And I think these are really important background issues um, with large corporations as well as governments 
uh, foreign governments and institutions, global institutions, that push agendas that aren't for the best of African nations. Uh, yes, we do acknowledge that there are serious problems in the health system, uh, in that they are poorly managed, the resources are poorly managed, there are weak governance and accountability issues. Um, we have a, nat a high burden of disease and um, there is a really low trust uh, and ownership by the population in their health systems. Uh, we do have challenges in the communities of health beliefs and societal practices that can be very challenging. But there are in fact opportunities and these are important to note. Uh, the African economic trajectory has been really rapidly growing. Um, the next century may be the African um, and the AU is certainly looking and seeing this as a, as a pro-people uh, union of the nations in Africa. Um, the key milestone for that has been the African Treated area, which is basically coming together to bring the single big, biggest economic bloc in the world um, together. Um, and there's a network of uh, traditional healers, uh, healthcare that we need to capitalize on. And uh, there's a strong political commitment uh, that we need to strengthen um, and also use. And of course, the demographic dividend or the growing population uh, of young people who in fact will contribute to uh, economically in the next century will be quite important um, to its growth and important opportunity. There are also other opportunities in the continent with uh, a fairly developed private sector. Um, you know, we have an ecosystem that is supportive of, of innovation, especially the lack of legacies, problems that exist in other parts of the world, um, and the speed with which uh, we can leapfrog others um, across the world. Uh, there is a strong civil society um, across Africa and growing um, in time. We do have well-trained and competent health professionals, even if they do leave the, the continent. And of course, COVID-19 has also helped us um, in strengthening health efforts, health uh, uh, strengthening efforts, especially with um, um, the AU collaborations. The HAG report came up with the recommendations, and I think I was really in pushing for this um, to be at the top. That really we need to reorient um, the health system towards population health needs. Um, especially prevention and promotion, and that there, there needs to be a strengthening of the primary health care system and prioritization. Um, health in all policies, that investments come to strengthen it, that we actually strengthen health facilities as well as the health care delivery, and particularly with flexible, non-hierarchical, multidisciplinary teams uh, made up of clinical and non-clinical staff to provide integrated clinical care or integrated health care to defined impaneled populations. And um, I think this is an important dimension and that these should be you know, part of not only delivery but contracting and reimbursement in prepayment uh, models. So this was an important achievement for Wonka uh, Africa in that. Of course, there are other health recommendations, including inputs, health technologies, quality, financing, and governance uh, in the HIC report. And uh, these particularly include that there be cross-cutting um, development strategy, making health that, and looking at stakeholder management, especially public-private partnerships, and to strengthen community participation. These were all health recommendations for health systems across Africa. But there were also recommendations for government and states to, in fact, decolonize health policy as an important consideration. Of course, other actions are also important, particularly the demographic dividend and investing in that for the future economically. Well, let me conclude by saying that we are looking at building Afro-PHC as an uh, important step in uh, UHC in Africa. And the Afro PHC is basically a forum bringing together um, multidisciplinary primary health care team members that's, and workforce stakeholders from across Africa and advocating, supporting each other and advocating for primary health care and universal coverage. Um, the Afro PHC has, was it conceived actually in, um, um, in the Wonka Africa Conference in 2019 and essentially grew um, through uh, 2020 uh, with a number of workshops and webinars um, that um, try to engage with a whole bundle of stakeholders, uh, importantly trying to 
bring on board um, the um, WHO Afro uh, as well as um, all key stakeholders and growing that network. Um, this certainly has um, improved in 2021 this year. We in fact have a, a number of workshops that have tried to pull together a number of policy threads um, and in, in building on the Afro PHC statement that came in 2020. Um, where P the wide range of members of the Afro PHC team um, agreed that all members of the team are important and that one needs to peel that away um, layer by layer uh, in trying to build primary health care and, and in UHC in Africa. Well, um, with these collaborative interactive workshops, we've formally launched Afro PHC in 2021 with 600 members from 40 countries and a, a busy developing a position paper on building the PHC team for UHC in Africa. Some of the key ideas is that we need to move away from governments thinking of health systems as driven only by the public service and to think of how to um, build in um, a much more wider uh, stewardship of the public service um, through pooling of funds in national health insurance funds or national funds um, that are taxed, um, built through tax and removing and reducing the out of pocket uh, in across the continent, across the countries, and to be able to get private administrators and private providers in the mix of um, health, public health and pub private sector and non-state act, uh, non-government uh, service providers, so that one can really include in small decentralized units of care, uh, even up to 10,000, where a doctor can join current clinics and where GPs can actually bring together a team to be able to create impaneled populations of anywhere from 10 to 20,000 to 30,000, depending on the African context. And I think there are some key principles behind that, that it must be built on teamwork, community orientation, referral support, and district coordination and supply side innovation, that this kind of bottom up allows us to be able to bring them together, adding layers of um, service that in fact can improve. Uh, in addition, that there's easy possibilities to accredit such um, units of care, decentralized units of care, where enrollment can occur and cover the entire population based on um, reasonable mixes of, of population to uh, human resources, Delta submission easily through payment, uh, through uh, simple payment management systems, peer review and training that would eventually lead to um, practices that in fact can be across the, con uh, the country and the continent. Uh, where there's a strong population management by community health workers linked to clinics where there's a reoriented of the reorientation of the team from above managers above to population below using mixed capitation systems and where there's stakeholder collaboration and targeted health promotion. Um, I think that these are the various options and I think that there's more on advancing primary health care in Africa at the website of the Afro PHC. I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shabir, for sharing these important experiences from Africa. And it's uh, very impressive to hear both the EMR and the uh, African experiences. And uh, from EMR and Africa, we now move to South Asia, and I'm delighted to introduce to you Raman Kumar, Dr. Raman Kumar, who is the past president of Wonka South Asia. He's also the president of the Indian Academy of Family uh, Physicians, and who better knows the situation in South Africa, South South Asia uh, than than he? So, over to you, Raman. <laughs> Hello, delegates. Uh, greeting from India, South Asia. I'm Dr. Raman Kumar. I'm the president of Wonka South Asia region. And I'll be giving you a brief update on experiences as perspective from South Asia and universal health coverage. So this is part of our uh, bigger uh, panel discussions that we are holding in the global health perspective. 
And this is what South Asia looks like. We have uh, countries like uh, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. And we are a quarter of human population. We are a small Wonka region though. And we see a lot of global disparities, inequities, inequalities, unmet needs, underdeveloped family medicine and primary care because of the special situation of high population and high population density. And this is uh, what the map looks like. And this is where we are uh, located. And there is pressing needs for program like universal health coverage from South Asian perspective. And uh, uh, this region has been trying to catch up globally on universal health coverage. And it has been, of course, impacted during past three years because of the global pandemic, because uh, especially the second wave of pandemic severely impacted our region. And because of the pandemic, most of the funding uh, healthcare uh, planning priorities have taken focus on uh, COVID management. And in a way, uh, uh, the universal health agenda has been slightly delayed, uh, I would say, because of the pandemic especially, but now the, as the pandemic is uh, settling down, it looks like, although we are still passing through the pandemic, we never know what will happen in coming two, three, six months. But uh, uh, at the moment it is settling. And then again, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, engage uh, with the universal health coverage agenda of the region. Uh, uh, in South Asia, I. Uh, I would like to uh, share that the first wave was not that strong, but second one wave was really, really very bad. It impacted whole of the, uh, not only health system people, uh, but also it has uh, impacted the whole of the uh, you know, economy. And it has severely uh, adversely impacted the evolving uh, universal health coverage agenda. So this is the current situation uh, as of today. This is 14 days back. It looks much better in South Asia as compared to uh, America or uh, Europe, Russia, but uh, it was very, very bad a couple of months back in the months of April and May when we had second wave. So we are coming out of it. And uh, 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 I have opportunity to attend the WHO regional committee meetings of uh, Southeast Asia region. And uh, from there, I can say that uh, universal health coverage is a uh, still a priority area and you can see priority issues or uh, as they were discussed during the past three uh, uh, regional committee meetings uh, so if you look at uh, number three point annual report on monitoring progress of university usc and health related sdgs so this was discussed during one of the committee meetings and other uh, uh, priority areas of our WHO region have also been regularly monitored in spite of the COVID challenge. So you can see it is still in the focus, though slightly uh, delayed, I would say. And uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, is all universal health coverage about in Southeast Asia region. It is from WHO page. And uh, as we all know, universal health coverage has two dimensions, access to needed health care and financial protection and uh, region has an essential health services index of 61 in 2019 as compared to 46 percent in 2010 which is improving and uh, strategies are in place and uh, it is evolving it is work in progress and every country is committed uh, what i can see uh, uh, irrespective of the financial situations and i'll share this screen uh, this is uh, from world bank group and it is the index of universal health coverage and the values you can see uh, the best one from sri lanka maldives uh, and bhutan because these are relatively small countries uh, india is scoring 55 slightly better than other countries and we do have you know other challenges political instability uh, and other uh, problems in our region, uh, financial of course, and this uh, report is from 2017, so we are ahead of this by around four or five years, though we have lost around two, three years in pandemic again, but I think we have been making steady progress. So I'll briefly discuss 
uh, about two countries, Sri Lanka, the best performing, and India because we have a huge population to cover and unique in its uh, uh, requirements. So they, that may be of interest to a uh, wider global audience. So this is again, you see all global organizations are focusing towards uh, universal health coverage. You see NSF uh, accelerating progress towards universal health coverage in South Asia and the era of COVID-19. So Sri Lanka is one of the most advanced uh, health systems and um, uh, largely uh, praised for their intent to implement universal health coverage and they have trying to do it since you know the past several decades and everybody gets uh, equal health care free at the point of delivery and they have publicly funded through general tax payment system and it is solely controlled by public sector uh, but uh, it is uh, pluralistic and encompassing both public and private sectors and uh, uh, public sector provides good quality health care at no cost to patients from primary to tertiary care but sri lankans still rely heavily on the private sector for outpatient care which involves out-of-pocket payments so this is a brief situation in sri lanka then i'll also talk about india india launched a, 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 its a national flagship program of universal health coverage under the leadership of the prime minister it is called aishman bharat uh, Pradhan Mantri Jan Swastha Yojana, uh, which means literally long live, healthy life. Uh, uh, Prime Minister's uh, uh, public health uh, uh, program. And this is what it means health coverage up to 5 lakhs per family. It is around, roughly around uh, seven to $8,000 per year for secondary and tertiary care hospitalization under Aishman Bharat program. And uh, this is uh, how it has evolved till now. Aishman Bharat program has crossed one crore milestone. Uh, one crore people have been given free treatment under this scheme till now. And it is a commitment to cover around 53 crore citizens. And health citizens cover up to five lakh family per year. And it will have primary and secondary care treatment at 2,100 and 500 in Thailand uh, uh, healthcare institutions and uh, under this scheme over 3000 citizens were tested this is old data but now we have a wide coverage of uh, uh, covid treatment as well as uh, screening and you can see our prime minister's image on this uh, slide because there's highest level of political commitment for this program and it is a completely cashless paperless access to services for beneficiaries at both public and private hospitals and this is uh, uh, briefly uh, shows the process of availing care and that uh, the universal health coverage that is evolving in India. Patient hospitalization, beneficiary identification, registration, pre creation request and approval, treatment, discharge, claim request and settlements. This is the cycle of care. And this is how it is digitally managed at the citizen level, hospitals level, and the uh, third party or insurance uh, uh, providers and this is overall digital framework commercial health program and this is the uh, health id looks like aishman bharat aragya card so again uh, 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 a digital uh, identity card for availing this uh, aishman bharat universal health coverage program in india and a national health agency has been established to overview and run this whole uh, process so this is briefly about uh, the universal health coverage development in spite of the COVID challenges, we are trying to progress. And even during COVID, the national health program, the universal healthcare program in India has given coverage for treatment of uh, many COVID patients also. And hopefully as we come out of the pandemic, it will have significant impact on the lives of the common people because a large uh, section of the population and we promised this in the most populated, one of the most populated countries of the world. So thank you very much, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, for patient listening. Thanks a lot. Namaste. Thank you very much indeed, panelists. Uh, we having a little bit of problems connecting our last speaker, Dr. Thomas 
me honor. So we might, uh, in the interim, start with questions that have come in. Uh, and the first, and I do encourage you to continue to write questions in the Q and A box. Uh, as we, if we can't connect uh, Dr. Thomas, we will obviously have a little bit more time uh, to ask questions of this distinguished panel and in, in learn from the discussion there. So the first question, um, Hassan, is, is for you. In your talk, you mentioned um, as one of the recommendations, a regional professional diploma in family medicine. And the question is, what role do you see family medicine and the development of family medicine playing as part of the solution in delivering universal health coverage in, in the Emerald region? Thanks a lot, Amanda. Thank you. Very good question, actually. Uh, okay. We keep saying that the primary health care is a cornerstone to reach to universal health coverage. Talking about universal health, uh, sorry, talking about the primary health care, it is not only about the governance or the finance or the information system. The core of the primary health care is the human resource development. The current situation in our region that more almost than quarter of a million of the physicians, they are generalists. They are not general practitioners. They are not a physician. Actually, the situation that 93% of the public primary health care facilities are managed by this generalist. This current era of generalists to be responsible about the delivering of the primary health care, definitely it will not reach us to the universal health coverage. For sure, we need to, to go for uh, the family physician. This is a key for us to reach, uh, to improve the, the physician's capacity and to move to the uh, universal health cover. That's why we developed already this regional professional diploma in family medicine in full cooperation with Wonka, and we already launched it, uh, something like more than almost 16 months ago. Then we decided to go on and to upgrade it for from one year to two years diploma, and we are going to launch it in the 20th Monday, 28th of February, in the coming year for the 2022. Over to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. And I wonder, um, uh, Rahman, if you would mind, um, if you are there, if you could turn your video on. Uh, I'm not uh, able to turn my video on. And, I, and do we yeah. have Dr. Thomas now? All right. Ah, thank you. Hello. Chris, okay. I'll hand back yeah. to you and we will continue. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Thomas. Uh, we have gone through the Eastern Mediterranean to Africa to South Asia. Now we are going to the Ibero-Americana region where initially we had Dr. Jacqueline Ponzo, the Wonka president for the region, uh, as a speaker. She was unable to join, but we're very happy, Dr. Thomas uh, Meono, that you stepped in last minute. I understand that you were recommended by her, so she, I'm sure you will be an excellent expert on the uh, universal health coverage struggle in your region. You have not pre-recorded your presentation, so you will give it it straight on now. So I turn over to you. The floor is yours. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so honored to be part of the of this panel and greetings from Costa Rica. So I will share my presentation. Well, uh, we will be talking about experiences and, per, and perspectives within Ibero-American theme in the matter that we are discussing on uh, universal health coverage. So we do some work before as 
in the Confederation, we have um, every two years, we reunite some people to uh, think about the processes in the different countries of our region. Then first of all, we like to take back the, the arms of the, of the whole definition that says that people are increasingly dissatisfied with the inability of health services and health systems have to respond better and faster to the challenges of a changing world. So we, in Brazil in uh, 2016, we have uh, the, the, the Wonka World Conference. And before that, we achieve a reunion and we discuss uh, the universal health coverage based on qualified primary health care. And we define that it means timely access for individuals, families, and communities without distinction to the goods and services that their health conditions require means access for people to comprehensive and coordinated care for a promotion, protection, assistance, and recovery of health in accordance with the needs they present in the course of their lives. In the end, this is the very reason for being of a service and a health system. This is one of the uh, matters that in, important to us in the Iberoamerican region. Our confederation or our organization over the course of more than three decades has worked for the development of family and community medicine on primary health care. And uh, to do so, we invite the other uh, health actors in Latin, America, in Latin America, Spain, and Portugal. And every two years, we have these, our summits. These reunions or these summits are political and technical scientific events. We exchange experiences and participatory activities with a strategic representative from the field of health, education, and research. And the results are expressed in the form of a letter, or we can say like an M -A -A, like a mole, which usually bears the name of the city which is carried out. I came with this because we in talk about universal health cover, coverage uh, very deeply in the fifth uh, summit in Quito in uh, 2014 uh, and family community medicine and social participation. In this, at, the, at that moment, we came with another definition of universal health coverage that we thought or we think that it suits better, better for, the, for the region. Uh, in spite of the universal health coverage definition uh, as it is, we added that half or have to have the first level of care at the axis of care with family and community doctors in the health teams. That's for ensuring the first contact and continuous monitoring centered around the person and their family and community context in accordance with the health needs they present in the course of their lives. In this summit, we identify difficulties in achieving universal access persisting in the Ibero-American countries, especially affecting the most vulnerable people, particularly indigenous, poor, and rural people, as we see in other regions. Regarding the access route to universal coverage, the continued dependence on direct payments in, our, in some of the, our countries, including user fees, is identified as the greatest obstacle to progress. Uh, we can name uh, an example like Costa Rica, which have uh, a little more than 95% of, of universal public health coverage, to Chile that has around 96, 97% of universal health coverage, but it's like 65% um, public and the rest is private. In 2014, only half of the countries in the American region have universal access to health system. Although in most, there are population groups without coverage. 
we have a highly fragmented health systems. The rights are granted, coverage and institutional arrangements vary, vary among different groups, like I said before. We have usually organized by a combination of traditional public sector services for low income groups, social security service for, for formal employees, in some cases extends to their families. Uh, for example, Costa Rica is, is one of the examples and private services for those with ability to pay. The lack of coordination between the three subsectors has been a source of inefficiency and inequities once the fragmentation hinders the efficiency use of the resources required to achieve universal health coverage. So in the next summit in uh, 2016, in, in, this, in, in our sixth uh, summit, we introduce universality and universal health coverage to, uh, as a continuum uh, for the work that we've been doing. And we did a, a lot of research in the, re in the region. And we define universality as the coverage that the population has for accessing health services and fulfill the right to it, which must be protected financially by public policies and actions of the state. And we de uh, define them also that must have scale and intensity proportional to the needs. We watch defined by Mammoth as proportionate universalism. Actions must be universal with a scale and intensity that is proportional to disadvantage rather than focusing only on the most favored. Thereby articulating the definition of universality with equity. Therefore, it is necessary to recognize equitable access to health services as a human right and not a privilege for those working in the formal sector or with greater financial resources. Our countries have a, a lot of uh, immigration uh, problems. Right? We, are, we are in continuous movement of, of people between our countries. In the research, we found some determinants in Latin America that limit achieve universality on the primary health care and in the family community medicine. Most of the people, we, we do this, or we did this uh, with an uh, online uh, survey, and most of the people think that the stru structure and management uh, will be the first uh, thing to achieve to get universality in the primary health care. And in the factors limiting considered by country to achieve the universality, the most of the countries also think that is structure and management. 29%, around 29% report foregoing need care due to multiple access barriers. 17 attribute to organizational issues. For example, long waiting times, inappropriate hours of operation, cumbersome administrative requirements, and financial barriers were reported in around 15% of cases. Inadequate availability of resources like health personnel, medicines, and inputs in around 8% of episodes and geographic barriers in 5% of the cases. 80% attributed to acceptability issues for example, language barriers, lack of trust in health personnel, or being mistreated by personnel preferred for traditional and indigenous medicine. People in the poorest wealth quintile were more likely to experience barriers related to acceptability issues, financial and geographic access, and availability of resources. So we came with some conclusions to our regions to achieve universal coverage must act strategically in the five key actions areas of primary healthcare. Collect and disseminate information for action, strengthening social participation, fostering skills and knowledge of the population on health, training and capacity building of human resources, acting interstructurally, reoriented healthcare. There are a consensus in our region that the concept of universality involves the right of the population to have access to primary health care and family and community medicine, 
with comprehensive approach, integrated and continuous, regardless of socioeconomic or geographical condition of the individual, family, or community. And continuous balance and structured work is necessary to ensure that those populations will let access to service reach a staggered and well-defined manner, the root process to define the scope according to the realities. And the active participation of the member of our regions in the context of development country policies to achieve improved access to services is necessary and binding. Regional strategies must be generated in which those with more experience provide a platform, platform for the country's universalization, find a space of consensus on which to prepare the strategies for presentations to local governments. And thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Thomas. And uh, if we can have all the panelists now with their videos on. Uh, we can uh, address some of the questions. And again, if anybody has any other questions that they would like to ask of the panelists, please, please enter them and we can address them in the, in the time we have now. Um, this, this question is really to all of the panel, um, and it has come up in, in, from the audience as well. Uh, Thomas, you mentioned the phrase universality with equity and talked about some of the issues of equity in the, in the provision of, of primary health care. And, and uh, I, in, in our panel, the, in the questions that came from the audience, it was says, how can we redress inequities within and between healthcare systems? And that universal healthcare is a prerequisite, but it's not the only, but a, a potentially an inadequate goal to address health equity. And so I'd be interested in what the panel thought about that relationship between universal health coverage and health equity. So I don't know, Thomas, if you would like to start, but I'd like all the, all the panellists perhaps to, to join in on that. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that to achieve universal health coverage with equity, we have to hear what the people needs first and take that from the governments and um, discuss what they really need. For example, in most of the countries in our region, there have been an uh, hospital side center uh, distribution of the money. So primarily care, and, and, and that was something that was so obvious with the COVID pandemic. In the primary care setting, uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of resources. To, to attend the necessities of the, of the population. But if you go to the hospital, you can find the most uh, new technology right, to, to attend the, the COVID patients or, or, or um, non-communicable diseases or whatever they need in that level. So I think that one of the, of the best things to do is to try to get the, all the levels of attention in one, in one route. We have, we have to build a real net that provide the right road for the people to go to the primary care level uh, with uh, accuracy, diagnosis, uh, access to, me to medications, and access to uh, consulting, uh, or you can uh, send them to the another levels, but always came back to the prim primary care setting to the follow-ups. So I, I think that one of the, the most important things to do is to have this strong net between the, the levels, the different levels of attention in the public setting. So the, the other thing is to invite the private sector 
to enjoy the net. So we can assure that if, if you have an insurance, uh, no matter if there's public or private insurance, you get what you really need. So Thank that's you. It. Other comments from, from panel members? I think Hassan. Shabir, did you unmute yourself? I think Hassan. Then? Hassan is pretty. Hassan high. has got his hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yes, Hassan, <laughs> please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Yes, definitely. The three dimensions for the universal health coverage, it is mainly talking about the equity. But as Thomas mentioned, that we have to look for more comprehensive things. We are talking about nine years from now. Let us be realistic. Some of the countries, by the way, from our region, from the Eastern Mediterranean region, they already announced that no way that they are going to reach 200% or to re for the universal health coverage index by the year of the 20, 2030. So the issue so far, which is the main challenges that facing the, the topic for the, the equity is the ministries of health capacities. They cannot deal with the topic of the universal health coverage. Why? Simply because the technical capacities for them if we will go for any Ministry of Health number of countries in our region, still they are lacking this technical capacity to formulate the policies toward effective universal health coverage in, I'm talking about my region at least. This is the most important thing. Over to you. Thank you for giving me the chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, perhaps I can respond as well. Thanks, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Amanda. Uh, you, you know, I think um, equity is, a, is, is an unreachable goal. It's something we have to do. It's an ideal. But I think there's never such a thing as all of us being equal at someday. It's, it's just never going to happen. But I think it's an important thing to always ask who's less privileged and how do we constantly address that problem and, and aim in that direction. I think the, in, in countries, there's a huge problem in, and particularly I think in low middle income countries, um, for there to move away from this uh, very bureaucratic approach of managing government, uh, which creates public services that are unresponsive, don't account for the private sector, and doesn't bring all of the different uh, you know, stakeholders together in that way or providers together to actually look at the best possible outcome for the populations. And I think that WHO is pushing by, by suggesting these kinds of approaches, bringing the public service, uh, private sector public into together into nationally funded insurance systems that will um, create a, um, you know, uh, panels and that will manage populations. And that's the kind of drive. And I think that is certainly something that doesn't need to be overly technically. Um, I think uh, tech technically in its management, it can be done simply. And I think there are good enough instances across the world of that being done fairly simply. I think the other problem with equity I have is that in, in the globe, we have 7 trillion of health spend across the world. And many of us sit here in different health systems and don't realize that only two and a half percent, if only two and a half percent of that were to be redistributed to, to, to people of need, that we would actually solve the global problem of universal coverage to primary health care. Add another two and a half percent and the full range would be addressed. Of course, the question will, what is that, what, what is that range of universal coverage? And I think it tends to be something which one can say in the current you know, terminology is relatively basic, but it shows the inequity in our globe. I think COVID itself has shown just how the rich just do not bother when it's survival to think about anybody but themselves. And I think we as an organization of family doctors need to ask ourselves, which side of this equation are we on? Thank you. Very rousing word, Shabir. Um, I think that almost drives us to the clear, to, to the end, but one of the things that we noted during the presentations was that COVID has been a huge challenge. And a number of you, you mentioned the amount of money and, and the demands that emergency care had. But some of you also said that the COVID had actually shown in your regions the importance of primary care. 
Um, and I just wonder if anybody wants to comment on, on that potential tension uh, and what COVID has, has shown us in the role of primary care and obviously in the context of universal coverage. Yes, Hassan, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again, uh, Amanda. Uh, during the first waves, by the way, about the, the COVID-19, the health system attention was almost more than 90, but almost 100% toward hospital care and completely ignoring the primary health care. I'm talking again about our, our region. And all, all the budget, all the attention, all the human resources, everything was toward that hospital care uh, keep saying that there is no any role for the for the primary health care in this i discussed the issue this is back almost to march or april i discussed this issue with a whole partners for the primary health care in our region and this is including of course the wonka unicef unfpa unaids unhcr and the arab board of health specializations really and good. we found that the main reason for this because there is no clear functions for the primary health care. That's why we developed an online training about the role of the primary health care. And we disseminated in a joint collaboration with our partners. And for the first time ever for the WHO and the, for the primary health care partners, we reached to the registration of almost more than 90,000 primary health care from our region, they registered for this. We moved to the next step and we decided to make an, a kind of an evaluation and to get kind of what kind of impact for this online training. We received uh, an, a feedback from the primary health care physician said that this kind of online training, they give us the strengths for how to deal with the primary health care with the core function during the, the COVID. So my point is that at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, the, there was no clear functions for the primary care. So having a kind of clear deliverable things like this online training, definitely it was very useful. Thank you again for giving me that. Thank you. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but I'll just give our last two panellists very, very brief couple of words on, on this. So uh, Thomas first and then Raman. Thank you, Amanda. Well, in primary care in our region, COVID it has a, a lot of tension because of the follow-ups. Uh, we In mo most of our countries, there were uh, telephone follow-ups or uh, uh, video calls to uh, follow-ups in, in uh, uh, housekeeping or house uh, care uh, of, the, of the patients with COVID. But not, not only with COVID, we are also so concerned about the next pandemic. You know, the non-communicable diseases and the other stuff that we are have to face right now. So the, all the diabetic people and uh, hypertension and, and everything that is out of control right now because of the COVID. Thank you. And a brief Thank comment, uh, Raman? I think uh, during pandemic, the first wave, there was more focus primarily because of the bureaucratic preference to focus on hospitals because it was easier to you know, quarantine and hospitalize in that sense. But during the second wave, which was very huge in a region, uh, everybody realized that the you know hospital approach of dealing with pandemics cannot you know uh, uh, solve the problems and overwhelming towards uh, the you know uh, as the second wave rose, more and more realization was for uh, primary care and access to you know a basic medical advice was very very valuable uh, because you know nobody was there to do anything, no hospital beds, no oxygen, nothing available. When that was exhausted, people realized that it was time for home care and then it moved towards home care, community-based management. Even the vaccination started with selected, selective uh, hospitals and then it moved into the community, to schools and to community health centers and to community setting. But it has given a message. 
Thank you. I think that's... that's that's a very nice phrase to end on. It has given a message. So I would just like to thank you all very much for the messages that you have given us about universal health coverage in the region, um, the challenges and and the successes and recommendations for way forward that very much involve um, family medicine and family physicians. So thank you all very much. Um, and that closes the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye -bye, everyone. Thank you very much and bye -bye. see you all bye -bye. soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.